Thank you for tuning into this White House event on making it easier to build accessory dwelling units or ADUs. This is part of a series of meetings we're hosted. We're hosting focused on actions to increase housing supply and lower housing prices. We know that the laws of supply and demand drive housing prices. For too many years, the United States has not produced enough housing to meet the demands of a growing nation. Finding affordable housing is hard everywhere in the US, particularly for the lowest income Americans. It's especially a challenge in certain regions where the labor market is tight and economic growth is strong. One study found that constraints on housing supply limit labor mobility, which in turn costs the economy up to 2% of GDP annually, or around $400 billion. That's why our administration has focused intently on addressing these housing challenges. In our first year, we secured a historic level of funding for affordable housing in the American Rescue Plan, both through emergency rental assistance and through supplemental funding for home and housing vouchers. The Biden-Harris administration also continues to work to enact our Build Back Better plan, which would make critical investments in housing supply through expanded tax credits and subsidies. In August, we announced administrative actions that HUD, Treasury, the Department of Agriculture, FHFA, will all take to add 100,000 new affordable housing units over the next three years. Through meetings like these, we hope to highlight the ways the federal government, plus our public, private, and nonprofit partners at the state and local levels, can together overcome barriers to increasing housing supply. ADUs are an important component of our push to increase the supply of affordable units. Over the course of the next hour or so, you'll hear from speakers about the importance of ADUs. ADUs provide several benefits to owners, renters, and their communities. They can serve as a multi-generational housing option to help families live closer together. ADUs can also help homeowners to generate income while also providing a lower cost unit for additional residents. And importantly, ADUs increase density in single family areas while using existing infrastructure systems. Despite their benefits, ADU development is held back by a few critical barriers, including local zoning restrictions, onerous development and permitting processes, and a lack of financing for interested homeowners. We all have a role to play in increasing housing supply. Today, we plan to highlight federal initiatives as well as state and local models to overcome these barriers. Private actors like banks and builders also make important decisions that influence the affordability and the availability of housing. We need to work together to address our nation's housing supply challenge. I wanna thank you again for your interest in increasing the supply of affordable housing. And with that, I will turn things over to Karen Chapel, a professor emerita of city and regional planning at the University of California at Berkeley and director of the School of Cities at the University of Toronto. For more context on the importance of ADUs as a strategy to increase affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss the growing body of evidence about the important role ADUs can play in adding to housing supply and promoting affordability. In case you haven't been following it, something very interesting happened in California in the past three years. For the first time in the US, we've seen how we can scale up ADU production from 2018 to 2020, California completed 23,000 ADUs with thousands more in the pipeline. The majority were backyard cottages, but many were garage conversions, basement conversions for additions to the house. They were built all over the state in all kinds of markets. How this happened is a story of research and advocacy, plus lots of education but it's also the story of what can happen through state action. 
the state had to make sure ADUs could be built as of right through a ministerial process. That was 2017. Then the state legislature had to go back year after year to get the ordinance right. They had to fix lot size, setbacks, impact fees, parking requirements, owner occupancy, and more. They're still working on the ordinance, but they're reaching scale. And it's not just California. Researchers at Freddie Mac have a brilliant new study out. They track rental listings for ADUs as an indicator, and they show rapid increases in active rental listings throughout the North and South, but particularly in the Sun Belt, the line in green. What's motivating homeowners? Well, it's primarily that we're in a rental housing affordability crisis, and also homeowners feel a bit trapped in their single family homes. They need more flexible housing to meet their life circumstances, whether it's the kid coming home from college or they have to care for a relative or work from home or just get more income. This chart, which is based on our Pacific Northwest survey, shows that two thirds of newly built ADUs are rented out. That's the blue slices of the pie. And the majority of those are rented to strangers, to arm's length tenants. Of course, some go to friends and families like the in-laws. But as this chart indicates, the ADU is rarely a short-term rental. And that finding, these findings about rental have held up across multiple surveys by multiple researchers. And one more thing about the need for flexibility. People generally don't build their ADU for just one use. They tend to rotate between uses depending on what they need, the rental income stream, the, the work from home space, et cetera. A study published just last month by the Urban Institute examined the potential for single family home lots to produce more affordable housing, whether through ADUs or increasing modular manufactured housing or just preserving homes. Altogether, they estimate that these housing types could add 4.7 million units over the next 10 years. Note that ADUs account for half of this potential housing supply. That is scale. People always ask if they're affordable. Some cities have tried deed restrictions for affordability with mixed results, but they're affordable by design. Multiple surveys have shown that they tend to cost less than half of what a single family home costs to construct, and they rent for less than, than similar sized apartments. Most rent for less than market rate, even to arm's length tenants. Another reason to support ADUs is that they help us use our big empty houses more efficiently. Oftentimes there's a mismatch between houses and family size as we grow older and the nest empties out. The Turner Center study showed here uh, shows that we're actually underutilizing more and more of our um, single family housing stock over time. From the Freddie Mac study again, we see that large parts of the country are building detached ADUs, and those are the ones in blue, many by carving space out of those big old houses. In the Southwest, we're more likely to see the backyard cottages in green. So just to add some more affordability benefits, ADUs can provide an income stream for low income or underwater homeowners at risk of foreclosure. The new ADU ordinances can also provide a path to legality for houses and homeowners with unpermitted space. And that then can mean more home equity. We get a fair housing win as we diversify the housing stock in affluent single family neighborhoods. Now we still have a few hard questions to think about, like how is housing discrimination unfolding in this stock? We know from studies that mom and pop landlords may screen out tenants based on racial prejudice, and there's little accountability here. And then also what protections do the tenants have? If you evict the tenant because you want the ADU back for mom, after all, you built the ADU in order to have flexibility, then what rights does the tenant have? And where can they get good counsel? So there's still work to be done. The biggest barrier left to scaling up ADUs is finance. 
our surveys have found that almost half of homeowners are building these from cash or credit cards. We've had a hard time getting conventional loans to work because banks don't want to count the future income stream from the ADU. Refis are the most common financing method, but they only work for certain households and during certain uh, periods of time when the interest, trade, interest rates are favorable. There's FHA tools like renovation loans, but the time limit on these can be too stringent. One way of thinking about the challenges different types of homeowner space is, do you have high income or low income? Do you have high home equity or low home equity? In red are those that struggle the most to get finance with low income and low home equity. But it's also hard for seniors on a fixed income, even if they do have home equity. So in conclusion, there's a role for the federal and state governments in supporting implementation. The states must reduce regulatory barriers, just like California did. This is key to scaling up. We need the FHFA to step up with regulatory relief, such as waivers to include rental income, or we can look at new products like bridge loans for homeowners. We need to educate homeowners. It's gotta take a village. The cities who are making this work are organizing workshops and fairs and creating handbooks and websites. And perhaps most important, this is not gonna happen unless we can build our capacity. We need to train both staff at the zoning desk and workers in the construction industry. And I'm gonna stop there to hand the stage over to Julian Joseph, the Deputy Assistant Director, Secretary, excuse me, at the Office of Single Family Housing, which is at the Federal Housing Administration at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. And I'm delighted to follow such an esteemed housing expert. Again, I am Julian Joseph, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Federal Housing Administration's Office of Single Family Housing. Our unique role and substantive presence in the housing market are intended to serve those who need us most, first time home buyers, low and moderate income individuals and families and communities of color. The topic of accessory dwelling units is particularly important to me and to those we serve. For many, including those in multi-generational homes, non-traditional family structures, or located in high cost areas, ADUs can offer increased affordability and unlock the potential for increased wealth building while expanding the supply of affordable housing. This past summer, we had several engagements with business leaders to hear their thoughts about addressing the critical need to increase affordable housing supply. There was a common theme in these discussions that affordable housing is an important issue for businesses of all sizes and for many reasons, including the fact that their ability to attract and retain employees is often contingent upon the ability of employees to live in proximity to where they work. The discussions all included ADUs as a top priority for addressing this challenge. Now I know that there's a recognition that making ADUs a more robust part of the housing supply will take everyone state and local governments, business leaders, and certainly the federal government, including HUD. We believe that FHA can play an important role in increasing the supply and affordable financing of properties with ADUs. And properties with an accessory dwelling unit are eligible for FHA insured mortgage financing if they meet local zoning requirements. Addressing exclusionary zoning laws that are a barrier to the construction and the use of ADUs must be a part of the solution. And let me assure you that HUD will continue to be a vocal advocate for the adoption of flexible zoning and land use policies that enable the construction of ADUs on existing parcels. Removing zoning barriers to ADUs is the first step and one that many states and cities have already taken. But making properties that already have ADUs affordable to finance using FHA insurance is another key step that we are taking. But we also need to make it affordable to build new ADUs. As the Urban Institute's December 2021 report on single family housing and the housing supply shortage points out, financing for ADU construction is difficult to obtain because for the most part, mortgage underwriting does not take expected rental income or the value of improvements into consideration. We are committed to looking at all of our policies around ADUs. For instance, current FHA policy makes a distinction between the treatment of a property with an ADU and a two unit property 
which may unnecessarily disadvantage properties with an ADU when it comes to access to FHA insured financing. We are also looking at our purchase transaction mortgage policies to identify areas where FHA financing can play a larger role in the acquisitions of homes with ADUs, particularly for low and moderate income households. And lastly, we are reviewing our renovation loan programs to identify opportunities where we can strengthen the availability of FHA insurance to support that construction of ADUs. To make informed decisions on how we move forward over the next year, to begin implementing these policy ideas. Both through the work we hope to begin specifically on ADUs and throughout all our policies and programs. Thank you again for your time today. And now let me turn it over to Mike Fernandez, Vice President of Engagement and Impact at Fannie Mae. If I could just ask uh, Mayor Weinberger to turn your video off, sorry. <laughs> and then um, Mike Fernandez, welcome. Julian, thank you very much. And thanks for everything that FHFA is doing to make ADUs more affordable. Let me first um, uh, thank Ambassador Rice and the White House Domestic Policy Council for facilitating this very important session today. Uh, creating affordable housing stock is our nation's biggest housing challenge. And we believe accessory dwelling units are one of the keys to improving affordable housing supply. Did you know that since 2012, Fannie Mae has purchased more than 150,000 mortgage loans secured by homes with ADUs, including 41,000 just in 2020? We expect this activity to increase as more and more communities become ADU friendly. Our support for financing homes with ADUs is just one of our many initiatives that are core to Fannie Mae's mission and our journey to be a world-class ESG company. At Fannie Mae, we know that ADUs contribute significantly to housing affordability, sustainability, and accessibility by increasing rental opportunities and offering more affordable housing to the community where it might not have been and not, might not have been accessible before. By generating additional income for homeowners that can be put toward keeping them in their homes and enjoying the community benefits of prolonged home ownership. And of course, by increasing the rental stock and providing additional housing opportunities in communities where rental properties may not have been an option. Just as states, counties, and cities are removing barriers and providing incentives to encourage homeowners to build ADUs, Fannie Mae, and with the support of our regulator, FHFA, is also working with lenders to attract greater adoption and lower the cost of mortgages for homes with ADUs. Together with our lending partners, we're facilitating the ability of homeowners to add ADUs to their properties with financing options such as Fannie Mae's home style renovation loans for constructing or installing a new ADU. These loans allow borrowers to leverage 30 year fixed rate financing with much lower interest rates. Essentially, this mortgage option treats ADUs as an eligible renovation, just like adding a room or new windows to your home. Home Ready, which is our low down payment mortgage for low income borrowers, is another important mortgage resource. This product allows ADU rental income as qualifying income to support a borrower's mortgage. And we purchase mortgage loans for properties with various types of ADUs, including site built ADUs, factory built ADUs that are then brought to the site and manufactured housing ADUs. All of these ADU types are eligible for financing. One of our experienced lending partners, Umpqua Bank, regularly reminds us that the expanding demand for loans on properties with ADUs, especially those with manufactured housing ADUs, and how that combination can truly enhance affordability. You'll hear from Mike Skinner of Umpqua Bank a little bit later in the program. Additionally, based on industry feedback, we are responsibly exploring additional options to encourage ADUs including using limited cash out refinancings 
as a takeout loan to pay off a second mortgage or a construction loan used by a homeowner to build or install an ADU. We're also allowing ADUs with several manufactured housing types as the primary residence, including MH Advantage eligible homes and HUD code manufactured homes. And finally, we're also leveraging innovative ADU initiatives like the California Housing Finance Agency's ADU grant program, which lowers the cost of new ADUs for income qualified borrowers. We're also exploring ways to work with appraisers to more easily incorporate ADU rental income into those appraisers, appraisals and working with lenders to include ADU rental income in the underwriting process. These enhancements would expand the eligibility of mortgage products, permitting someone to purchase or refinance a home with an ADU and to use that rental income from the ADU to help qualify for that mortgage. We also recognize that the renting of an ADU is gonna be new to many homeowners and we'll leverage our learnings to help homeowners make informed decisions. We also know that with the right partnerships, ADUs preserve affordability. Through Fannie Mae's Sustainable Communities Initiative and our work with the West Denver Renaissance Collaborative, Habitat for Humanity and local governments, we were able to help streamline the ADU process and reduce overall ADU development costs for West Denver area homeowners by 45 to 65%. So with your continued support and engagement in the ADU space, we can have a substantial positive impact in increasing the supply of affordable housing. So on behalf of the entire Fannie Mae team, thank you for your interest in ADUs. Thank you for having us here today. And I'll now, now turn the program over to Erica Pothig, Special Assistant to the President for Housing and Urban Policy, Domestic Policy Council, who will be the moderator for the next session. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Mike. That was a really exciting set of initiatives that both Julian and you laid out. Appreciate uh, you sharing them with us today. I'm going to invite the rest of my panel uh, to turn their um, videos on and uh, to, to come off mute and welcome, welcome. Um, so as we've already heard a bit, uh, accessory dwelling units are not a new idea. In many respects, they have been part of our housing supply for decades. As Dr. Chappell illustrated, in some regions, the common template is a detached unit, and in other regions, the units are attached. Creating these units, however, takes a friendly regulatory environment, financing, and home buyer uh, and homeowner uh, education. To lower the barriers to ADU creation, there is also a growing industry of builders uh, that are producing these kinds of detached uh, units. And the first panel that we bring to you today is going to discuss the national, state, and local efforts that have accelerated the adoption of ADU policies and practices and led to the increased creation of ADUs. So let's get into this conversation. Uh, and first, let me introduce our panel. First, we have Mayor Nora Weinberger, who's been mayor of Burlington, Vermont since 2012. A former affordable housing developer, Mayor Weinberger spearheaded Burlington's suite of ADU reforms that went into effect right before the pandemic. Robert Liberty, um, has worked on residential zoning reform since the 1980s. He has done work as a nonprofit attorney, an elected official, running university programs, and now as a consultant to AARP and others. He and his husband are happy owners of a small ADU and have enjoyed becoming friends with their renters. Denise Kingston founded and serves as president of the Casita Coalition, which advocates for small homes ADUs, cottage clusters, and duplexes to help improve housing choice and opportunity throughout California. And Rodney Harrell is AARP's enterprise lead on housing um, and also leads AARP's Public Policy Institute's team of issue experts on long-term services and support, caregiving, and livable communities. Terrific, excited to be in conversation with you today. Mayor Weinberger, I'm going to turn to you uh, first. Mr. Mayor, you became uh, mayor of Burlington, Vermont. You were a housing developer, so you understand the process of what it takes to create housing firsthand. So in, in 2020, Burlington passed a suite of these changes uh, to make it easier to build ADUs. 
what were most the most significant components of that reform and what barriers were they designed uh, to overcome? Great, thank you, Erica, and thank you uh, to the White House for hosting this event. It's exciting uh, to be a part of this and to see this focus on a really critical housing strategy. Um, we did uh, make changes in 2020 after two um, summits, housing summits, that were led from the mayor's office and that were really focused on uh, increasing housing supply. Uh, I've been mayor for a decade now, and we've had a big focus on changing the conversation towards increasing supply throughout that time. Um, and uh, having those summits did seem to change attitudes about ADUs, which had previously been greeted with some suspicion by um, many neighborhoods, particularly neighborhoods near our universities, and really seemed to change the environment. The substantive changes that we got done that time, um, uh, got done in 2020 after previous resistance included making ADUs legal in all zoning districts that had not previously been the case, uh, streamlining the permitting by um, uh, basically making the permit an administrative permit as opposed to one requiring a board process most of the time. Um, there became the, the maximum allowable size was increased uh, to 30% of the size of the primary home or 800 square feet, whichever was greater. We got lit, rid of uh, a tough parking requirement um, uh, that uh, was a, an obstacle in many cases. And we addressed um, lock coverage issues uh, that basically um, often stormwater issues had blocked ADUs before and we, and we got rid of that. Um, one change we didn't get done, and I, I do have some regret about that, I think it, it's one that maybe we'll take another shot at, at some point, is we, we still, ADUs are only available on home ownership, uh, if, if there's a homeowner in the, in the you know, on site, um, that does limit the adoption. Um, and, you know, perhaps for that reason, we have seen some uh, real progress since we got this done. We've seen about almost a doubling of uh, the uptake, but um, it's been, we hope for even more in the future. That's terrific. Well, thank you for being um, a North Star for other communities as they seek to, to adopt these policies too. Robert, I think, you know, homeowners seeking to build ADUs on their properties often face some of these same zoning and permitting challenges like the ones Mayor Weinberger just described. Um, tell us, give us some hope here. How are other jurisdictions overcoming these challenges, uh, particularly ones that you've had an opportunity to work with? Erica, based on what we've seen across the country, we know that local officials can allow ADUs to blossom if they make a few basic changes to their local zoning regulations. Here's a simple rule of thumb. Treat ADUs the way you treat any other home. When someone wants to build a home on a residential lot, do your regulations require you to mail public notices to the neighbors, review the design to see if you approve of their taste and architecture, hold public hearings and allow appeals to the city, town, or county council? If not, then treat detached ADUs the same way. When someone wants to remodel their home, do you apply a special design standard? Notice notify the neighbors, hold public hearings and allow appeals. If not, then treat remodeling a home to create an internal ADU the same way. Do you require the owner of a home to live in it? If not, then why require the owner to live on the property if they own an ADU? You know, banks won't provide financing to build an ADU if there's an owner occupancy condition and it makes a property hard to sell. Don't require additional parking. Requiring on-site parking can make it impossible to build an ADU in neighborhoods with smaller lots and hills. Many of us have seen neighborhoods where homeowners don't use their garage because it's full of stuff and they're not using their driveways. If driveways are empty, then there's no shortage of parking. And what's more important anyway to your community, housing people or housing cars? To summarize, these key reforms are Review ADUs like homes, administratively using clear and objective standards. Avoid discretionary standards like consistent with the character of the neighborhood. Those kinds of standards create uncertainty and result in neighbor versus neighbor battles. Don't require the owner of the main house to live on the property and don't require additional parking, especially not neighborhoods where that requirement is gonna prevent ADU construction. Now, as uh, the mayor has indicated and our other speakers indicate, there are many other changes to zoning standards and I will note building codes that will facilitate ADU construction. I look to the AARP model local ordinance to learn about them. There's a few other things that communities can do to promote ADU construction uh, other than changing regulations. 
governments can waive development fees to jumpstart the ADU market. That made a huge difference here in the Portland area. ADU tours are fun ways for homeowners to see ADUs and learn from other homeowners, their peers, people they trust about their experience. Architects, realtors, bankers, and planners can sponsor professional education programs to help them expand their skills to help homeowners build ADUs. And finally, last and certainly not least, there's a bunch of ways uh, we can help moderate income homeowners and renters to benefit from the opportunity to build and rent an ADU. Thanks, Sarah. Fantastic. Thank you, Robert. Um, so at the start of Dr. Chappell's presentation, she led with the story of California and the, the results of uh, state legislation and, um, and the role that it's played in creating a more supportive environment for ADUs. Um, Denise, I know you played a key role in that. Can you share more with us about what are the benefits of state standards like those in California? and share a little bit more about uh, the impact of this more uniform approach on ADU development. Sure, um, and thank you very much for hosting this. I'm pleased to be here with many of my friends and colleagues who helped California get to where we are today. Um, so California's <coughs> statewide laws allow an ADU and a kind of an accessory unit, junior ADU, so two, two units on a single family parcel and units in multifamily parcels across 450 cities and 58 counties as of a year ago. So massive geography, huge numbers of cities, 7 million single family homes, and many million more multifamily buildings are now eligible to do more or less exactly the same thing in the same geographic dimension with the same ministerial by right process. So that has unleashed what UC Berkeley is calling an ADU revolution in California. Um, we're going on 40 to 50,000 ADUs. Karen's data referred to prior to 2020. These think we're adding tens and tens of thousands more ADUs every year, year over year in California. They now comprise 11% of all residential building permits issued in the state, 38% of permits in the city of San Jose, 20 to 30% of all building permits issued in communities in Southern California. And as a multifamily units accelerate, you'll see more and more of these, which means we estimate four to $5 billion of private investment without public subsidy, um, tens of thousands of jobs. We know, I know personally of hundreds of millions of dollars of venture capital money that's been invested into startups, dozens and dozens of startups in California that are further building in a factory, lowering costs, lowering design and innovating both by lowering costs and doing more quicker delivery models so that homeowners don't always have to be developers. Because that can be a real challenge for homeowners as your other panelists have pointed out. And some of these business models look like the solar industry where a homeowner provides the space and a company comes in and builds permits, designs and finds a tenant for and manages the ADU. So all the homeowner does is, is make the space available and collect the check. So the, these models are sorting out, but, but really uniform standards across wide geographies that allow businesses to sell everywhere the same product unleashes tremendous private innovation and will deliver hundreds of thousands of accessory dwelling units into California in the next decade easily. Well, that's uh, very exciting. And thank you for the updated information about uh, just what this, these laws have unleashed. Um, Rodney, turning to you, I know from ARP's research that increasingly more older adults are wanting to age in place. Um, as Ambassador Rice pointed out in the beginning and Dr. Chapel pointed out that um, oftentimes the views are used to facilitate more uh, multi-generational living. So how, help us understand how ADUs are an answer to the aspiration. Uh, I know that many older adults have and what role uh, AARP plays to educate homeowners, work with the industry and advise on legislative solutions? Thanks, Erica, that's a great question and I'd be happy to talk about it. Uh, first, to your point and Ambassador Rice's point, uh, we know from our surveys that over three quarters of older adults want to stay in the communities where they live for as long as possible. So people don't uh, want to move and uh, they'd like to figure out ways to do that. But there's a challenge. And that's that our housing stock isn't really built for that. Uh, people over 65 will outnumber those under 18 by 2034. 
And this means we're at a fundamental time for changing our approach to housing overall. For a long time, we could get away with focusing on younger populations. But now, to your point, we truly live in a multi-generational society. And that means our housing should match that. But our practices of zoning and development have meant that over 80% of the housing in the average neighborhood are single family housing only. So what that does is it limits choices for many groups, including older adults. And unfortunately, in some places, those zoning rules have been designed specifically to limit choices and keep certain people out of their communities. And in doing so, the negative uh, additional side effect is that they limit choices for the residents in their own neighborhoods who may benefit from having another option as they age. And uh, you know, the other issue recently is that the tragedy of over 100,000 people dying in nursing homes from COVID has really become a reminder to many that the more options we have to live or stay in the communities we love, the better off we can be. And this is in addition to all of the benefits we've talked earlier today about having a more affordable form of housing uh, and housing affordability into our stock. And so uh, all these are great reasons to have ADUs and there's great potential interest out there. Our new home and community pre preference survey a couple of months ago showed that over 60% of adults would consider living in ADUs to be near someone but maintain their own space or if they needed help with that, uh, daily activities. And I've seen the interest among policymakers and others grow over the last uh, decade or so. And it's uh, very inspiring to hear that. Uh, now, we know ADUs are not a silver bullet, but to me, they are the single best way to bring new housing options into the existing livable communities where people live. It puts the power in individual homeowners' hands to create more options for themselves or family members or others. And these options can have universal design features to make it easier to get around. They can be more affordable or they can provide that rental income that allows someone to stay in their neighborhood. So these are some of the reasons why ARP is taking a multifaceted approach on this issue. Uh, we've recently updated the model uh, act that Robert mentioned. Uh, we've, we've created a design and development guide and an intro guide on the ABCs of ADUs. And we have much more on our website. We use this in our advocacy efforts and many of our state offices are working with local leaders on expanding ADUs. Uh, we've heard about California's advancements in this call, but just in the past year, we've worked towards advancements in eight states and our communities. Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Connecticut, Washington, Arizona, Oregon, Utah. And in a total of 20 states, ARP state offices are working on ADUs. So that momentum really is growing. Uh, our world-renowned livability index that measures new, uh, every neighborhood uh, in the country, we're adding state policies on ADUs to that index this year to reflect the benefits of this option. And our relationships with organizations such as the National Association of Realtors and Lowe's and the American Planning Association are really helping us to get the word out about why creating more housing options is so important and using the stories and the power of stories to help encourage others. And finally, and most directly, we host webinars and other events to talk to ARP members and commu other community members directly to explain the benefits of ADUs and ways that we can step past challenges and the unfounded fears that are behind some of the elements that Robert mentioned. And one of those key barriers we're trying to tackle is the understanding that consumers have about ADUs and the resources that can help guide them to that process. So there's more I could talk about, but I'll just mention aarp.org slash ADUs. Uh, but in short, taking advantage of this option means that we should take steps to educate ourselves and create partnerships across communities because that's the real way to make these successes happen. That's terrific. Thank you, Rodney. And that's a wonderful segue uh, to a question to you, Denise, and to others on the panel, too, who want to weigh in on this. So I think everybody's pointed out, uh, but I think you live also very much uh, that any getting any of these changes over the finish line takes a coalition. Uh, and building that coalition is multifaceted in nature. Um, so share with us, because I think we want to lift the hood a little bit on these policy changes and understand the how, uh, how they got done. And uh, Denise, you built a coalition in California to get these policies over the finish line. What were some insights from that? What were also some of the key messages to, Robert, to everybody's point, really, that were most instrumental in building support? You know, I think, and this is true in any political environment, uh, you want as wide and big and broad a coalition as possible with people who don't typically side with one another all together. So in California, our coalition included environmentalists, NRDC was a bill um, endorser, uh, labor unions, teachers unions uh, who thought they needed more housing for their members. 
um, business community, chambers of commerce, business association, big businesses in California who know they need housing for their employees, cities of different sizes who had already begun experimenting with broader ADU rules, who helped counter voices from cities who didn't want state intervention. And, and by having a very broad tent with initially a very simple message, a lot of noise is made about local control, and we think that means city hall. It really doesn't. Local control begins at home. As, as Rodney and Karen have, and others have pointed out, a homeowner needs to be able to make their home flexible over time. No one tells you how many kids you can have, how many cars you can own, and how many dogs are gonna bark in your yard. Why should we decide if grandma lives in the garage with her own bathroom and toothbrush cup? And so just appealing to human nature and the need for homeowners to make decisions about their family safety and their family evolution over time we need to restore local control to where it belongs. Let homeowners decide how to use their properties as long as they're not creating a nuisance. And that very simple messaging is how we framed the initial ADU law. And there are lots of other framing. It's green, it's more equitable, it's more inclusive, it's more affordable. It, it kind of depends who you talk to, which one you want to emphasize. But the importance of reaching out to shared values in a society torn by divisions is really important when you make such a big change. And I think, you know, the Sears Robot Catalog Company sold 75,000 homes uniformly across the country over 100 years ago because we all knew we needed lower priced homes. We all know we need that. And so let's find a way where we can start doing it big at scale together. That's great. I told Denise on an earlier call, one of those 75,000 homes is just like a block uh, away from where I live uh, in Arlington, Virginia. So they, they still are standing. Um, Mr. Mayor, you obviously also had experience building the coalition to get your policy over the finish line. Any more insight on what it takes, the messages that worked um, from your perspective? Yes, Erica, uh, you know, all of these housing efforts, certainly coalition building is a key part of it. You know, I was thinking, um, I think it was reading about a thousand friends of uh, Oregon uh, that I had gotten the idea of really intentionally building um, coalitions uh, for this policy and others. And we, we could, we for years uh, trailed off a little bit during the pandemic, but would pull together on a monthly basis um, all of those groups that Denise was just talking about uh, to keep them up to date on what the city was doing, uh, get their feedback, and that proved enormously powerful in, in making change. Specifically to the ADUs, we had AARP's help. Um, they were really uh, very much engaged. I encourage any mayor to, you know, may not be a resource of your new mayor you're familiar with, that um, the AARP has such a local presence and can help uh, with issues like this and other transportation issues, really quality of life issues is a great resource. We had an organization called Home Share Vermont as well, who for years had been trying to, trying to partner um, uh, people who needed housing uh, with people who had essentially space in their, in their homes and they were a key partner as well. So um, yeah, key part of getting this done is, is thinking upfront about that, Erica. That's great. Well, as we close out this panel, I'm gonna give space and room uh, for all the panelists to say, if you had one piece of advice, um, for elected officials, for planning officials, or other champions in other cities or states that are doing this, what would that piece of advice be? I'm going to go first to you, uh, Robert. Uh, what's, what's your best piece of advice? Others have done it. There's no need to fear. The water's a lot warmer once you jump in. And by the way, Mayor Weinberger, thanks for the shout out for a Thousand Friends of Oregon. I directed that organization for many years. That's all right. A lot of love on this panel. Okay, Rodney, what's your one piece of advice? Yep. Uh, well, Robert stole my advice about really following uh, the template of what others have done and how useful that is. So I'll say that we should uh, also uh, uh, you know, take a wide approach and think about uh, the benefits in the many different ways to meet all the goals you can. It's not just about affordability. It may be about aging in place. It may be about options. It may be, be about equity, but really look at all the benefits that you can have. And that really will help you move forward. Right. Denise? One piece my, 
My advice is think big. When, when we started California law, no other state legalized it by building permit ADUs quite that way. And, and we got laughed out of rooms for months while we were incubating this idea. But thanks to people like AARP and Robert Liberty and Karen Chapel and others, we just kept going with the idea that everyone, a chicken in every pot and an ADU in every backyard, maybe we can restore California's uh, golden days. Great, Mr. Mayor, I'm gonna give you the last word. What's your, what's your best piece of advice to other mayors around the country uh, seeking to do this policy? Yeah, well, one, one of the great challenges of being a mayor is um, figuring out what you're gonna focus you, you and your team on. And if the message I have for mayors is this is a policy change that can make a difference. And this is a change that you can get done. And uh, I hope uh, hearing from these experts today um, reinforces that. Um, if you can get it done in Burlington, which is a, a place that I think traditionally has been quite skeptical of uh, changes like this, I'm really convinced any city in America with some staff focus and political capital can make this happen. Terrific, thank you. Um, thanks to my panel uh, for bringing um, some real talk to this issue, but also some inspiration. Uh, much appreciated, Rodney, Robert, Denise, and Mayor Weinberger. Um, thank you. Um, with that, I'm gonna introduce my colleague uh, who will introduce the next panel, Bharat Ramamurti, who is Deputy Director uh, of the National Economic Council. Uh, welcome, Bharat, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Erica, and thanks everyone on that last panel. Uh, it was really uh, insightful to, to listen in. Um, as Erica said, uh, my name is Bharat Ramamurti. I'm the Deputy Director of the National Economic Council, and I'm uh, really excited to be here to discuss uh, this important issue. Um, as it has been mentioned several times already, we, we in the administration see uh, addressing housing supply issues as a critically important part of the President's agenda to expand economic capacity and achieve uh, equitable growth. And of course, producing more ADUs throughout the country is one of the best ways we can go about uh, boosting supply. When we think about constraints to housing supply generally, two of the biggest issues are uh, land constraints and financing constraints. Uh, and the same is true for ADUs in particular. More and more states and jurisdictions around the country are moving to address the land constraint by making ADU production legal. That's a necessary and obviously critical first step. Um, we are also seeing jurisdictions and organizations around the country making the ADU process easier and more streamlined, uh, which is, of course, the focus of the last panel. That's another critical piece. But improving financing options for ADUs is particularly important, especially for lower wealth or income homeowners or homeowners without a lot of equity in their homes, uh, homeowners for whom conventional lending may not be sufficient. Uh, and that's where this panel comes in. Our focus is on ways to increase availability and access to ADU financing. And I'm pleased to be joined by some of the leading practitioners in this space to talk about best practices emerging throughout the country. So joining us today is uh, Noni Ramos, the CEO of Housing Trust Silicon Valley, uh, Kevin Skinner, the Executive Vice President uh, and Head of Home Lending at uh, Uncle Bank, and Tom DeSimone, the President and CEO of Genesis uh, LA. Thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, Noni, I'll start with you. We know that one of the challenges here is incre increasing awareness of ADU financing options. Can you talk about some of the education work that Housing Trust Silicon Valley has done, both to increase awareness and understanding of the financing options that may be available? Thank you so much again for the opportunity to participate on this panel. Uh, since the inception of our ADU initiative, Small Homes, Big Impact, we have focused on both providing education, as well as developing financing tools to assist homeowners looking to build ADUs. Our original strategy was to explore existing loan products in the marketplace and develop a program to extend or facilitate lending to low-income homeowners. What we learned through our research is that there are many factors, many of which you've already heard about today, including financing, that affect the success of homeowners being able to build and finance an ADU. Our findings included the fact that many homeowners lacked information and that often discouraged them as they contemplated building an ADU on their property. 
We also found that there was a need to reduce risk and uncertainty for homeowners as they entered into, which for many is a very large and probably only construction project that they might undertake. There was a need to provide high quality, comprehensive information to homeowners. Uh, there was also not readily available financing products, although we've made a lot of progress, as again, we've heard today, that specifically were designed to financing ADUs. So we embarked on an education campaign by hosting workshops that were attended by over 550 homeowners in our area. We also hosted an ADU open house tour series for homeowners so that we could really display what ADUs look like and how they might uh, be positioned on a property. And then we also hosted an ADU conference for public officials with a panel of experts because, because as we've heard again today, having that public support in communities can allow homeowners to proceed with these type of projects. Uh, we also created a planning grant program because homeowners need some seed capital, particularly if they're homeowners that don't have access to their own cash or cash readily available. Uh, those planning grants, we made 18 of those at $1,500 per grant to those homeowners. Based on our findings, based on that research, based on that education and outreach that we did, we also developed a construction bridge loan product that is intended to be supported by the future rental income that would be generated by the ADU. Uh, and yet even with the product, we're finding that homeowners are still facing challenges associated with costs, project management, physical site limitations, and varying interest in becoming, and really knowledge of how to become a landlord in many instances. So thank you for that opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, Kevin, I want to go to you next. Uh, you've observed uh, various levels of take up with your program. Can you talk a little bit about the kinds of borrowers that might already be well supported by the market and conventional bank loans uh, and where government entities, nonprofit organizations and others may need to provide additional support? Thank you, Barad. It's uh, my pleasure to, to join you, Noni and Tom, on this uh, panel today. And thank you for the question. Um, the impetus for our focus in, in this specific area actually came from our customers uh, who told us what they're trying to do to create more housing. Uh, it aligns well with our bank's purpose to build economic vitality for the greater good. Uh, and we believe, uh, like the others on these panels, that affordable housing is a national imperative uh, and an important responsibility of the nation's banks to support. We are actively lending on ADU properties in our construction programs and our permanent portfolio and also in partnership with the government and the government sponsored ag agencies. A couple of points I'd like to share from our learned experience. Uh, first, for homeowners with significant equity in their home and or higher incomes, there's generally plenty of capital available through existing lending programs. Creativity is required for homeowners who need rental income or down payment assistance to qualify for the loan. We are actively working with Fannie Mae to explore such options. Second, we've had success in both urban and rural markets. We've financed projects for infill housing and city environments, but also where apartments are built above backyard shops, or where mobile homes are installed into large rural plots to house extended families. And third, by allowing manufactured and factory built units, in addition to stick built, we can expand the universe of potential borrowers who can capitalize on this opportunity. So I'd like to offer a few suggestions for consideration by policymakers, regulators, and legislatures that could enhance the flow of financing for ADUs, particularly for homeowners of more moderate means. And these will echo some of the themes offered by Dr. Chapel, Mike Hernandez, and other speakers. First, with 80% of the single family financing in this country provided through Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, or USDA, those entities offer a compelling opportunity to deliver solutions at scale. Options for consideration include allowing the inclusion of prospective rental income in the underwriting decision, expanding the unit and occupancy combination types eligible for owner-occupied and, and single-unit pricing not subject to price adjusters, 
allowing higher loan to values for cash out financing when the cash will be invested in building an ADU. Each of these options could be bundled with income and property count limitations to target the opportunity for lower and moderate income households. Second, for banks who are lending in their portfolios, capital reserve requirements could be lightened to encourage certain construction types through either a guarantee or lower risk weighting during construction. Third, homeowner tax incentives or grants could be used to defray the upfront development cost for permitting, site work, and other costs that can run into the tens of thousands. Models for this are solar panel installation and electric car incentives. And finally, incentives for builders who could concentrate on this market opportunity could be helpful. Presently, it is far more efficient for a home builder to focus on large projects where the benefits of scale accrue. Again, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to participate in this important discussion. Uh, thanks a lot, Kevin. Really good insights there. Uh, Tom, let me turn to you now. Uh, I know your model uh, uh, specifically focuses on both ADU production uh, and ensuring that low and moderate income people can rent ADUs. Can you talk about that approach and the benefits for both uh, lower income homeowner, homeowners and tenants? Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So we started our work in ADUs in 2016 before the state changed its laws and all those little dots showed up on the map that uh, Dr. Chappell shared earlier. So you, as you could see from that map, a lot has changed obviously in the regulatory environment, but also financing is working for a segment of the market. People have been able to access it, but many low and moderate income families continue to be shut out from that system. And these are the folks really who rely on future value of the property after the ADU is built and the income from it uh, needing to be counted into the underwriting qualifications today. And that barrier, that timing issue uh, creates the inability to access capital now to construct ADUs for these folks. Um, so we worked with the Self-Help Federal Credit Union to design a new mortgage product that would underwrite to those future conditions, the future value uh, for collateral qualification and counting 75% of the prospective uh, rental income from the ADU to count in terms of personal income to service the, the new higher mortgage. Um, the product worked by refinancing the homeowner's existing mortgage and uh, so that the credit union could get a first on the property and then extending a second tranche of financing to actually finance the development of the ADU. And that second tranche was what Genesis LA provided a guarantee for to help de-risk uh, the credit union developing this new product. Uh, the idea was that it would uh, be a pilot and as time wore on and the concept proved out, the guarantee would, would be needed less and less and less, hopefully, because this was successful. Um, another component of the program was that we required participants to uh, rent their ADU to a Section 8 voucher holder for five years. We all, as um, mission-driven lenders, uh, wanted to make sure that low-income people could benefit from this as a form of housing without putting covenants and such on someone's biggest asset, you know, the way to wealth in the United States. Um, a few takeaways, the, the product um, was, the uptake was quite slow, surprisingly, and we think there's a couple dynamics at play. Um, one, we think that most moderate income homeowners uh, were able to access capital through the conventional cash out refinance system. That's particularly true in a place like California where, where property values just keep going through the roof. And so you're constantly building collateral to borrow against. Um, and with mortgage rates low, you can borrow more money, you know, all things else relatively stable. So I think that those dynamics as the economy changes and appreciation isn't growing so fast and such, interest rates go up. A product like this, I think, could become much more uh, highly utilized by folks and, and much more necessary. Uh, the second piece is that many of the low-income homeowners who uh, approached us, um, unfortunately, even though they were sort of maybe cash poor but house rich, there were other variables that prevented them from accessing uh, capital in general. Either their incomes were just too low to sustain the, rent, the, the mortgage even with the accommodations of this product, or they were too highly indebted uh, from a debt to income perspective for qualifications. And I think that you know something that would be would really be warranted would be to look at, at those homeowners um, and, and to Kevin's point, 
uh, incentives, whether those are, are, are subsidies or other types of tax credits or things uh, to really help push those homeowners over the hurdle to make constructing ADUs viable, uh, because that could be a tremendous pipeline for true affordable housing. Um, thanks, Tom, and thanks uh, each of you for those uh, opening comments. Uh, with the time left, I just want to ask uh, a couple of questions for uh, for each of you. Maybe we can go around the horn, uh, starting with Tom. Um, you know, what if you were to give a you know one or two pieces of advice for other lenders working in this space, whether it's banks or CDFIs? Uh, what would you recommend? Sure. You know, I think uh, the product that I described um, relied on refinancing the first mortgage. Uh, and, and in an interest rate environment like that, it was less painful, but there were certainly setbacks or, or, or drawbacks of it. Um, you have to get a new appraisal. You have to pay a lot of fees on the bulk of the mortgage, which is your existing first mortgage. Um, and I, I think those sorts of drawbacks will become amplified as interest rates change. People will be forced to exit a very attractive low interest rate and perhaps have to borrow a whole new mortgage at a higher interest rate. So I think for the lender community trying to develop uh, a second mortgage product, um, maybe even if that's short term and, and it could be blended with the existing first lender on the property, um, exploring ideas like that so that homeowners are not only incentivized to uh, you know, create these ADUs, uh, but they're also able to maintain their existing attractive affordable mortgages. Thanks, uh, Kevin, what do you think? Uh, in addition to the points Tom makes, which which are excellent, I, I think construction lending and a construction project, as was noted earlier, is is, is a complex endeavor, uh, which highlights the critical importance of, of uh, homeowner education about the nature of the process and the uh, moving parts. Uh, it's also, from the perspective of a lender, uh, quite a complex. Um, operation and it's important to make sure that you have um, I, I think a team of people not just inside your institution but uh, sort of surrounding the project uh, who have a great deal of expertise in, in construction processes uh, the risks associated with uh, supply chain this year in particular have highlighted the nature and, and the complexity of, of those programs uh, and to make sure you're working with people that have a, a fair amount of expertise in the space. Uh, Noni? So I'd, I'd follow up on those points and add that certainly technical assistance and being able, being able to have partner entities that can work with the homeowners as they plan out their entire project, they go through the permitting process, they go through the design and whatnot. And then also looking at uh, different types of building approaches, right? I think that for us, one of our learnings was, well, we focused on more of a thick build type of product. There are, as was noted earlier in some of the comments, there are new building approaches that could potentially be more streamlined in terms of time. They could also reduce costs. But in order to support those, there has to be financing that would allow for the, that type of building yeah. approach. So, you know, technical assistance, uh, project management, and the ability to look at different types of building approaches. Thanks. So one more question uh, for each of you, and uh, some of you have touched on this already, but you know, we're, we're entering a period where um, you know, things might be changing in, in the housing market. We've obviously over the last 15 years generally been uh, in an environment with very low interest rates. I've seen the Fed is independent. It's going to do what it's going to do. But a lot of projections suggest that we could be in a period where uh, rates are starting to go up. Uh, how, how, if at all, do you think that affects uh, the decisions that you're making and, and decisions on the homeowner side about uh, moving forward with an ADU? Maybe, Noni, I can start with you and go, go around the horn. Sure. Well, I think that if we are entering, which uh, indications are that we're going to be entering into a rising interest rate environment, it does mean that for many of the homeowners who've been able to access, whether it's a cash out refinance uh, or a home equity line of credit, those 
those options may not be as viable, particularly for folks that are more moderate to low income. And so therefore the need to create the types of products that have been discussed, which I was really encouraged about listening to uh, some of the other panelists, some of the type of products that have been developed and being able to scale those. Uh, I think that one component is, in essence, I think of ADU financing as creating a market versus servicing an existing market, right? Because we need to have homeowners be able to come to the table wanting to access these products. So it's really a twofold. It's creating the products that have the flexibility and then creating the pipeline of homeowners that would be able to access those. Uh, great, Kevin or Tom, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? Just briefly, I think the, the point about rising interest rates is an important one to understand and it will increase the you know, marginal cost to, to deliver this, uh, whatever solutions we, we uh, pursue. And, and that's something that needs to be incorporated into how we think about it. I, I think it's also helpful to, to step back and realize that, you know, it, whether interest rates go to four or four and a half percent, they are still uh, low by historical purposes. And I think if we, if we pull some of the levers that have been discussed uh, by this group uh, today, uh, we have far more opportunity than than would be blunted by uh, you know a, a slight increase in, in interest rates. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, of course, you know if, if mortgage rates are going up, it's just becoming a bit more expensive for folks to do this. So perhaps the scaling of this, which we're starting to see, will help drive costs down. But to Noni's point, I think other uh, construction methodologies uh, that could be streamlined, that could create efficiencies. You know, there's two parts of the equation: you can make the financing cheap but you could also make the development process cheap. And I think what you're seeing in California from a regulatory environment, um, helping small contractors get up and going and be able to do this quicker and more efficiently. All of those are real factors that I think we as a lending community uh, can't discount as being you know, very much important to making the, the financing work as well. Thanks a lot. I think we're right about at time. I want to thank uh, Noni and Tom and Kevin for uh, their remarks today. It was incredibly uh, informational. Uh, and, um, and with that, I want to turn it over to uh, uh, the next panel, which will be led by uh, the fantastic uh, acting director of the Federal Housing Finance Agency, Sandra Thompson. Great. Thank you, Bharat. And that was some great information um, with Tom and Noni and Kevin, and I really want to thank you all for uh, the helpful hints that you gave on financing in particular. We've had some great panel discussions today, and I do want to thank the White House for organizing this very important conversation. As we've heard across the United States, there's a widespread shortage of affordable housing. Accessory dwelling units, while one of the smallest increments of housing, can represent a first step towards filling in the mi missing middle of many neighborhoods and communities. ADUs can be carved out of existing spaces like finished basements that, that can be newly constructed and they can fit around a property. They can also be attached to the primary home or separate from it. The diversity and flexibility of ADUs represents a core benefit for both homeowners and renters. But there can be potential challenges, as we've heard today, with some of the local zoning restrictions and permitting process. But we've also heard some potential solutions to those challenges. With regard to liquidity, FHFA will continue to explore what more Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac might be able to do to support the growth of accessory dwelling units as a source of new housing supply. As you heard earlier, Freddie Mac released an innovative new study on growth in the national ADU housing stock. And Freddie does in fact purchase single unit mortgages with ADUs. I might also mention that as the lines between ADUs and two unit properties can be thin at times, it's worth noting that Freddie has announced new mortgage eligibility standards for two to four unit properties that will add to the availability of credit rental units in these property types. ADUs, like two to four unit properties, can be affordable and they can be an important source of additional income and generational wealth building, especially for communities of color. And as Mike Hernandez discussed earlier, 
Fannie Mae also purchases mortgages with ADUs, and they've been working on several ADU-specific flexibilities, including allowing limited cash-out refis for ADU construction, examining how rental income is counted, and supporting manufactured housing products. Each new ADU that is built will be the result of individual decisions on the part of homeowners, builders, and local policymakers. As many states and localities change their policies to facilitate the return of this very traditional form of housing, FHFA will continue to work with the enterprises in pursuing opportunities to support ADUs and the growth of our nation's housing supply. I found today's conversations exciting and encouraging. Addressing the affordable housing crisis will require us all to stay engaged in the process and to keep sharing our knowledge and experiences, just like today's speakers. Thank you again to the White House for organizing this event, and thanks to all of you for participating.